Hi, and welcome to Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Mueller. I'm your host, Brad Wilder. Today on the show, Kira Davis is with us. She's all the way from California, where, well, liberals run deep. And I tell you, John's here as well, and he's going to do a quick interview with Kira about, well, not only running for school board, but also how she has uh, challenged the school board system in California and uh, the outcomes that she's seen happen so far. We'll be back with more here on Unmasking the Trans Movement right after this. Join Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler Sunday, April 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as he hosts Unmasking the Trans Movement's next webinar where we connect you with the clinical professionals who provide understanding on the many topics that make up this disturbing ideology and answer any questions you may have. Protecting the most vulnerable women and children. Unmasking the Trans Movement. For more info on guests, dates, times, and pricing, see us online at UnmaskingTheTransMovement.com. Welcome back. John Euler is standing by. Let's bring John into the program right now. John, a big day as we get Kira on the show. Um, what, uh, what are we about to, to talk about today, John? Well, Brad, I, I met a new hero and uh, quickly become uh, good friends in a brief period of time because we, have, we are of kindred spirit. Uh, Kira Davis is someone who I came across online. I uh, tackle some issues on different social media platforms, and I was quickly taken by how forthright, especially dealing with issues of what I call the trans deception, so the trans movement, as far as the harms it is doing, and what is being pumped into schools. We had Pierre Barnes on the program showing parents the kind of books that are uh, being pumped in, and Kira basically had had enough. She is a mother, and she realized she needed to get involved. She has a podcast entitled Just Listen to Yourself, and I am, as we are talking, I'm going to bring that up because it is so crucial for parents to understand that we cannot leave this uh, to chance any longer. And, and sex toys. I'm not going to answer that question. I think that is a question that the gay community in America has to answer for themselves. My point is in all of this and talking about all of this and being so explicit with this conversation is this. Whatever you do on your own time, whatever you look at, that is fine. But it's not a culture war for someone to say, hey, when I'm not sitting in the classroom with my kid, when I'm not sitting right next to my kid, I don't really like the idea of another adult talking to my child about sex toys, oral, te oral sex, or anal penetration, their genitals or otherwise. I, those are conversations I don't need my kid to have in school. It doesn't make them safer to have them in school. It makes me feel unsafe. And you don't need those conversations to protect them from anything. See, the way that sex ed got into our schools was after the sexual revolution, people... And she is exactly correct. She goes on to talk about how many sexual predators have been discovered in the school system. And, and that is why I couldn't be any more pleased to have Kira on with us. Kira, welcome to Unmasking the Trans Movement. Thank you, John. Um, it's good to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wish we didn't have to talk about this kind of stuff, but I'm glad somebody's talking about it. You have a, a website. Would you give that? Well, I am going to show people the title of your book. Where can people yeah. get a hold of you? Well, if people want to learn more about me, see what I'm doing, you can go to justkiradavis.com. That's K I R A justkiradavis.com and there i've got links to my book drawing lines there it is why conservatives must begin to battle fiercely in the arena of ideas i start that book off with the conversation around the transgender movement and women's rights because in this book i outline the top nine or ten cultural issues that are affecting america and i i break down the arguments for and against those issues and then i give people practical advice for how you can get involved and how you can start being a part of the battle right where you are. Not everybody's going to run for office, but everybody's got something they can do 
right where they are. Um, but I start with the transgender movement. It's the, that chapter is titled Women's Rights uh, because that's what I feel is really, really in danger um, at the feet of this movement, our children and femininity, womanhood. Um, and those are, for obvious reasons, intimately connected. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I, I, I think that this is, um, it's a huge, huge issue with deep consequences. And I find it terrifying how swiftly it has spread into social acceptability. Um, and now we're, you know, now we're, we're, we're running from behind. And so we need to try to catch up, figure out what to do. So I like guys like you, John, because you are, you are offering information and solution, uncovering the truths about things so we can have the conversations we need to have to roll some of this back if that's possible. Um, but we need more of it. So are there any there adults in the room, Kira? <laughs> um, metaphorically speaking, no, the, the adults are not in charge. I, this is how I feel when I look around. This is how I feel when I hear my daughter come home from high school and talk about what the, her teachers are saying and doing in school. This is how I feel when I go to my school board meetings. This is how I feel when I turn on my TV and I see a bunch of kids protesting. For, they don't know what they're protesting for. They're just out there causing havoc, looking for some kind of belonging. I look around at our cities. I live in California, like you said, and our cities are falling apart. Um, Whole Foods just closed in San Francisco. Um, they opened a store in downtown San Francisco and they didn't last a year. They cannot handle the crime, the open air drug markets, the homelessness, the disease, the pestilence, all of it. So all of this is a result. You know, and, and Carol, let me jump in. You know, isn't that ironic? You know, I, I'm a native California myself. Right, as uh, you and I talked about. And so the state is falling apart because policies matter, policies have consequences, yet look at the focus on uh, trying to sterilize and amputate our kids through the guise of the trans deception, which is allowing them, making them susceptible to financial, medical, big pharma, and sexual predators, yet that entire state is falling apart. It is so agenda-driven. And then now it's a sanctuary state where kids, in essence, can be lured into that state, especially foster kids. All they have to do is cross the state lines and they can go get their breasts chopped off without parental uh, approval or permission or the parents being able to do anything about it. It has to be, it's, it's unbelievable to watch from afar you're still in the state. It's terrifying. Again, this is the thing. I, I just, the adults are not in charge and we're not stepping up. And when we're looking at, I think this, when I first decided this was a real issue for me was I was fighting the sex ed agenda here in California back in 2017 when we passed it. The sex ed agenda that we have now, this curriculum um, is actually the genesis of the transgender laws that now have passed down it started with this curriculum we but said that, it, it was very coming. methodical this has been a very, very methodical right very it, this yes. has been a tactic this yes. is an agenda yes it is an agenda when you find out who wrote the sex ed curriculum you know when you go and look at it and they have all kinds of i, I talked about it in that podcast that you played a, a clip from but they have all kinds of ways of getting this curriculum into our school and hiding it so it looks like uh, pe people and parents are crazy when we're saying, hey, there's a recommended book about masturbation to my for my five-year-old in this curriculum. And they go, oh, it's not there. Go look, it's not there. Well, it's not there in the, t in the textbook. It's there in the recommended materials, which means it's legal for teachers to present it in the classroom. It's all been very methodical. I find it frightening. I find it frightening. I, I love the term you use, John. Well, you talk about, um, maybe you can remind me of it, but you talk about setting the highest standard of safety. Raising the bar, a high Raising bar approach. The, bar. the high bar approach, I love that. The high bar approach for safety for our kids, you know, used to be that that, that was, you know, that that was the norm. Sure. You have a high bar of, of, of spiritual and moral safety for your kids. Now, of course, I'm Gen X, so, I was raised in a generation that was like, here's a key, go play outside until the lights come on. But 
it, but in that respect, there was also this attitude of, yes, but there are some things my kid doesn't see or watch or participate in because these aren't, are completely inappropriate spaces for children to be around. Um, I think the, the boomers, the hippie movement had a lot to do with shredding that. I mean, I'm the child of two hippies and I've seen <laughs> some things. <laughs> I have seen some things, um, which has changed how I think how I parent. Um, but yeah, the idea that, uh, and it's all over the map, isn't it? Cause it's like, we don't trust our kids to today in the news cycle. We're talking about how early you should let your kid work. Somebody saw a 13 year old working at Chick-fil-A and he made a tick, uh, you know, an, a, an indignant TikTok video. So, you know, on the one hand, we're like 13 is too young to work and hold a job and earn money, but it's old enough to, you know, lie to your parents and go have permanently mutilating surgery. The fact that we even are having this conversation blows my mind. To think that something like this uh, uh, podcast or program, I guess we're a program, right? Or yours, that we have to address these things. It's surreal. And that's why I really appreciate your approach. What you say is the goal is to help people think deeply and it's important right at the outset for us to say listen we are not against any people group that is a that's a red herring right Mm -hmm. we we want all people to have the their best life now so to speak quoting joel Osteen, but i'm not a big fan of his but anyways right so you want people to be prosperous you want people to be healthy and and have good lives but the question is what what will get them there? What will enhance that? And so if somebody is pushing a lie, if somebody is pushing something that is deceptive, an agenda that ultimately is going to leave them worse off, leave them harmed, and especially if they're manipulating and exploiting a vulnerable people group, uh, especially young people with untreated mental health issues, then somebody, it's exactly as you say, are there no adults in the room that can discern this and can see this? Because there was a day, and as you ran for school board, and I want to hear that decision, all right? How did you decide that? But uh, school board members, teachers, anybody that deals with kids, they are mandated reporters. And my concern about, among other things, this whole thing is it not only is harming kids, leaving them sterilized and amputated, but it dumbs down discernment. To where what used to be the you know the red flag indicators which still are the red flag indicators of predation a kid is being perped on there are indicators now they're automatically reframed in terms of gender and off to the gender clinic they go to get sterilized and amputated and if we have a predator bumping and grinding or coming in in women's underwear and and drag or any other you know, those are more the extreme ones. That is not so much my concern. Of course, that's a concern. But it, it's the ones that are showing undue attention toward a kid's sex and sexuality and pushing single spaces and suggesting these deviant men can go into women's sports and then also into women's prisons. We've got an issue because you've opened the door for the wolves. We're driving and the mental health of these kids deeper. It doesn't clear up. It gets deeper. Because of this situation, this does not solve their problems. This is this that we could talk like for 24 hours about that. I mean, I actually have it. I have a whiteboard here in my office where I list all of the different topics I'm going to talk about on my show next and mental health, the mental health situation in the Western world is on. That's a big topic has to do with a lot of different factors, one being the destruction of the nuclear family and how that has ripped uh, a firm foundation from generations now. And we are seeing the dire and dark consequences of, of normalizing that and accepting it. But I talk about the sexual predator angle in that podcast too. And I said, I say, this is one of the things that we're not talking about is, you know, when my kids were young, I have a son in college and a daughter in high school. When my kids were young and they went to their stranger danger um, uh, assembly at school, 
one of the things that the counselors talked about because i went to our assembly to see what they're saying she said you know when we're talking to young kids we don't want to over sexualize or scare them you know we don't want to over sexualize the situation or scare them so we just we tell them things like wherever your bathing suit covers that's a private area and so that's a place you know that is for you and for your parents if they're helping you and you should be concerned if people want to touch there or have you remove your clothing from there or are curious about what's underneath there that's a, a flag but in this new culture this new sexual identity culture all of that gets erased. What happens to stranger danger? Well, now it has molded into, hey, your body, there's nothing to be ashamed of. And um, good people talk about their bodies with each other and good people aren't afraid to show their bodies to each other. And good people make mockery of the human body. And, and suddenly it's removing these red flags that we used to use to keep our kids safe. Now those are gone. I believe the term that's being overused lately, but that is absolutely appropriate is grooming. Desexualizing your children. That's a technical term. That is absolutely appropriate. In sex offender treatment uh, groups that I run, that is exactly what all the guys understand. Though, that This is what they do. It is grooming, which is systematically overriding boundaries. It's a very methodical approach. It's mental and emotional manipulation. I was watching, um, this is not uh, on the subject of child abuse, but I was watching um, the prime documentary series, House of Hammer, where it, it they follow actor Army Hammer, who recently had a fall from grace. He, was, he turned out to be very heavy into BDSM, but a very extreme version and maybe a budding cannibal. And so the Hammer family, they own Arm and Hammer products and they have this very seedy, um, passed all the way back to the when they came from Russia. They're communists. They're now the richest, one of the wealthiest families in the world. And Army Hammer is just the latest of uh, Hammer guys to get caught. Anyway, they're interviewing some of his women, some of his girlfriends. This is a handsome, wealthy, attractive Hollywood celebrity. And he's convincing these girls that tying them up, biting them, beating them, cutting them so he could you know ingest their blood he he's convincing these beautiful accomplished successful women to go along with this and after they got out of the relationship they were saying you know he just kept pushing my boundaries you know i'm a business owner i own a business i've been taking care of myself for years but it started out as this he just accepted me you know and it was like a love bomb and then um and then and it was like, well, let's do this, okay? Um, and then we pushed it a little further and a little further every time until it got to the point where if I felt uncomfortable with something, I thought it was my fault. I thought, because I have not, I'm just not mature enough. And that's what predators do to children, right? Uh, there because we go. And then that's exactly, okay, and that's exactly what's been incorporated into, think about the mantra now. If a, if a parent goes in front of the school board and holds up one of these books, who has the issue now? It's been flipped. It's exactly this method of grooming. Now all of a sudden, oh, the 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 parent has the issue. Right, <laughs> right, and um, and that was what I faced when I was running for school board. And recently, we did the same thing. A lot of parents are doing. We took the books to school, and uh, we read from them. And we were scolded for reading from them because they were too explicit and there were children at that meeting. And we so were you, let me, okay, Kara, this is what people need to understand. Yeah. So the books that are available to, made available to kids, mm -hmm. you took, you had in your hand, mm -hmm. the book that's sitting in your kid's school library and you brought that with you to the school board meeting. You held up the book that you, your kid could go and and check out at the library. So you have the material that that school board's making available to your kid, and you simply do oral reading of the book that they are making available uh, to your kid and tell us the response. Uh, I was called a transphobe, a bigot. Um, I had a whole slew of parents and students come after me and, and call me uh, and tell me that I was um, being divisive um i'm making it unsafe 
for LGBT youth at school. Because you were raising concern, you were reading this and you raised concerns about whether or not this was appropriate to read, to, to have available to young kids. Describe for the viewers what you, what you found in these books. What parents need to know are sitting in their school libraries probably right now for elementary. One of the, one of the books that's widely available, it probably is in your public school, is a book called This Book is Gay. And it is aimed at LGBT youth, um, aimed at, it's supposed to be an inclusive book that helps them um, come to terms with their gay identity or get in touch with it, I don't know. But there are very graphic descriptions in that particular book about about um, how to uh, participate in homosexual sex. So there are descriptions of um, sodomy, anal sex, um, masturbation, um, uh, oral sex, penetration, um, and sex toys like dildos and strap-ons. And this is like, I'm a mother and a wife. Like, these are not words I should be speaking out loud in public places. And yet I'm having to discuss these things at school board meetings. It's insane. And some of them are, are graphic novels. So there's one novel in particular which shows young boys how to perform oral sex on grown men. And this is the other part of the trans culture that we're not allowed to talk about. And this is very heavy in gay culture too, unfortunately, is relate the relationship between adults and minors. Most people have been groomed by an adult in these lifestyles and it's passed off as normal. And oh well, you know, people who, who, are, who are punishing parents like me for reading these things at school and calling me a bigot, they ha for them, that behavior is normalized. You know, if one thing and I can so mention here about John Euler that uh, he has uh, taught me along the last, you know, three, four, five months, um, one of the things that becomes a really good comeback to these teachers calling you all those derogatory terms, or uh, I guess it's not even teachers, it's uh, trustees and school board officials and superintendents. Um, they're unduly influencing these kids. Unduly influencing. And I know that, that, that that's a term John uses quite regularly, and we reuse it for a reason. Because ultimately... This unduly influencing relates to back to criminal allegations that I believe should be prosecuted for, which is coercion. They're coercing these kids to read these books. They're coercing these kids to act it out. They're coercing these kids to do things that they shouldn't be doing at that age. There's the coercion. How about the intimidation? Well, no, everybody else in the room is participating. No, everybody else in the room is doing it. No, you can't. There's the intimidation. If you don't, Guess what? There's going to be consequences. If you keep We've talking like that, there's going to be consequences. If you keep calling kids in your class those names, there will be consequences. You know, this has become a real battle because we know that there are good kids still left in these schools who have, who have a full understanding of what the hell's going on here. And those kids are, like I say, it's, it's, at the end of the shows, I say it's not our kids' fight, it's our fight. But our yes. kids are knee deep in it and our kids, yeah. they also need to stand up. And that's the way I've brought my daughter and my son up was when you get challenged like that in school, you stand up to that teacher. They're not the be all end all. They don't own you. And I don't own you either. But I tell you what, you're closer to me owning you than a teacher ever owning you. So I tell you, that's we, we've got to make sure we maintain some of that um, dynamic within our families and and i think that that's slipping away and i think that this coercion that's intimidation really extortion you know just join us here's a free lollipop you know it's like giving kids candy and sucking them into this and now we're it's talking about five-year-olds doing it it's not just a lollipop that's a good analogy it's not just a lollipop i was talking to somebody um a few months ago about this issue and i was saying look there, there's all. This is what my book is about too. How there, the battle has many fronts, and you've just got to pick one. This is one battle to win back the cult culture. But it's not just that. But it's, it's, 
we all know being a child is you're finding yourself. It's a confusing time and it's made more confusing by the internet, by social media, by the destruction of the nuclear family. A lot of fatherless kids run around out there. It's made it all more difficult to um, drill down on um, who you are. We used to identify ourselves by ex many external factors, a uh, faith, which used to be more common, you know, God, patriotism, which no longer exists in schools anymore, uh, your family, your tribe, you know, who you're from, um, who you associate with, and your community. And we no longer identify with these outward, these things that pull us outward to see a larger world and a larger purpose. Now we're told everything's in here. It's the self. Now we have to look inward and we're, we're grossly under prepared <laughs> to look inside ourselves and come away with anything good what's in here is not that great um, i'm a christian and the bible says that you know the heart is wicked above all things uh, everything's catered to self self help it, it self breeds a profound degree of narcissism it does that's exactly self-entitlement you're raising narc and so so here is what these because we've got we've been dealing the fox news picked up the story of one of the schools in my district the teacher has a gay friendly library we've been complaining about it for years but lids of TikTok picked up this teacher's TikTok account she's transgender and she's gone from from female to male she's she's recorded her top surgery and she teaches english at san juan hills high school here in southern california my i was running to represent that school she has this gay library in there one of the but one of the reasons the students love her even the students that know what that that gay library is weird it's, it's wrong it's got all those books i was just talking about in it and um she's a great teacher but the thing that she does too is she makes them feel accepted so that's the lollipop right that is the, i keep telling people we can't it's not enough to stamp our feet and tell our children, like, you do what I say, not what they say. We also have to have other ways to create environments where kids feel accepted, where they feel welcomed because, and that's either your family, your church, your community. If your kid doesn't have a place where they feel welcome and accepted and that's a safe place, they're gonna go to people like that teacher. And that's a, they, another form of grooming. You manipulate a child by making them feel like, I get you. You know, and as parents, we especially have to be careful to be those people. We need to be those people for our kids. Like, I see you. I get you. You don't need to go to other people to find your purpose and identity. It's a big part of it. And, uh, Carrie, you just, right, you reference safe place. So the the concern is that if we do not have discernment, and if we are not able to spot red flags, we are not able to uh, see that there are those that do not have the best of intentions, but appear as though they do. And now, where once upon a time, if you saw naked adult men dressing up in women, or putting a horn on their head, by the way, the unicorn horn is the number one pedophile symbol, at one point in time, we would have called this um, corruption of minors, and these guys would be doing, uh, you know, two to four or five to ten years in prison. As a matter of fact, the men in my sex offender treatment groups want to know why these guys are getting off, and they didn't. Hmm. So now if we bring this up, what are we? We're bigoted. We're Meanwhile, the predators, see, the reality is this. These men have to prove to me, prove to us, that they're not doing exactly what this looks like. Because if we were to hear, oh, this is what they were doing behind closed doors, what, practicing a film shoot? Yet now, everything's been so dumbed down and inverted that no wonder that man on the right who was, who was on RuPaul Drag Race is laughing so much. Because they're laughing all the way to the bank. You say a lot, John, one of the things that you say on Twitter a lot is, I wonder what we would find on his computer. There we go. And I think there are a lot of people who were looking at those pictures, were looking at, um, and like, don't get me wrong, like I've been to drag shows 
I enjoy a good drag show. I've never taken my kindergartner to a drag show because it's highly sexualized. It's a, it's, but I do, but there are things we like to pretend that these are harmless pursuits, but a lot of times I think if we knew what was on the computers, we might think differently. And now we're starting to see this movement become violent. And that is really concerning. To no, actually, me. that's a good thing. And you know why I say it's a good thing is because it proves that this is no longer entertainment related. There is no entertainment value or factor here whatsoever. It used to be, it used to be go to the club and do what you said and enjoy the show and laugh and giggle. They have those kinds of shows in Vegas every night of the week. Right. But they're shows. It stays within the confines of that 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 bar, that nightclub, that restaurant, whatever. But this is like sick, deviant, mental health patients who need assistance. I would never, I'm a mother. I have seen my kids in every state of being, you know, um, that you can see another human being in. I carried them inside my body. They were literally expelled from my body. There is no more intimate connection between two people than the one between somebody who literally carries another human life inside of them. And even I would not pose naked next to my child for a picture. I would never do that. It would, even if it, it was for fun, um, it, I could, I can imagine no circumstance under which that would be okay for me to take my then five-year-old son or nine-year-old son and us just get right naked and take some fun cute pictures with some fun makeup and prosthetics on i would be called an insane person i don't know but suddenly we have put this hedge of protection around these adults who aren't even related to these children you know and we're saying it's okay it's just it blows my mind this is pure insanity there, there you go. Uh, Kara, we've just gotten in. We've just got it, it gotten started, but we're up against the clock. Would you be willing to stay uh, for us for a part two? Because what we're, among other things, we want to hear how you decided to run for school board, but we are also going to review the contents of your book. We're going to have you kind of walk through your book with uh, some of the primary concerns that you have so that ultimately we can be all about the business of protecting those uh, from influences and dark special interests that would seek to unduly influence our kids and ultimately prey upon them both financially and sexually. Would you be willing to stay with us for part two? Of course, it would be my pleasure. Wonderful. Brad, this is intense. Uh, Kara is... Uh, one of my new heroes. I'm so glad she's uh, with us on this program. And Brad, thank you as always for being our our producer and our our voice of reason. You're very welcome, and thank you both. There is lots more to come in part two with Kira Davis here on Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. I'm your host, Brad Wilder. Remember, it's not our kids' fight; it's our fight. You can find us at unmaskingthetransmovement.com. You can also find us on our BitChute channel where all of our episodes are posted there too. I'll see you next time.